Hey, Professor. So, uh, in 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 the slide of uh, the beyond your, uh, I mean, the pure, um, we, I mean, the method is not restricting us to use negative samples, right? We can still incorporate negative samples in those. I mean, so two augmentations means that we are trying to uh, make those representations similar. In the same way, I can say that you know uh, any negative sam sample as we do in a contrastive learning setting, I can choose one and. Uh, apply a contrastive learning to you know make those representations like dissimilar or like far away far apart yes you could do that but we actually wanted to avoid it because of the cost i see it's, it's either a computational cost or a memory cost when you're creating that bank of keys that you're comparing to yeah you're sacrificing memory or you're trading off memory it's going to be more memory compared to computation so in the end of the day, having negative examples is either increase your computational cost or memory cost. It's a good idea to be able to get rid of them either way. I see. I also had one more question. So uh, in most of the contrastive learning setting, how do, how, I mean, is there any theory about choosing how much negative samples should be used per, you know, positive sample or does it vary? Uh, I don't think there is much theory about it. But we saw a theorem here that the more samples you have, the more negative examples, this mm -hmm. log term is going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. and if the log term is bigger, you're increasing the mutual information between the two views. And this is mathematically speaking why larger K matters. At the but same time, if you're minimizing the contrastive loss, you're mm -hmm. maximizing its negative. Yeah. Therefore, you're increasing the mutual information. I see. But having a larger K would also mean that there's also, I mean, the probability of, you know, having a, um, like a, um, a, 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 like a wrong label. I mean, so since these are computed in a, we don't actually know is, if it's a positive pair or a negative pair. We assume that it's a, it should be a negative pair, but then it can be that the negative, I mean, the positive pair was a dog and also the possibility of, you know, dog being included as a negative pair that also increases, right? Yeah, that's correct. If you think about it from a classification perspective, correct. Yeah. But if you think about it from each image is its mm -hmm. own cluster center, then you're just fine. You're just trying to make two different views of the same image similar to each other while making one image and another one different. Okay. So you know actually what is positive, what is negative. I see. Contrastive learning. Yeah. Yeah, and also at the last you talked about um, the, I mean, crops being, you know, smaller. I mean, would that work for like a, a general data set? Because I mean, ImageNet is like an object-centered data set, right? That should work for that. But then, I mean, increasing, decreasing the crop size, you know, making the crop crop size more competitive would mean that you're actually losing uh, the area of object. I mean, it's become more and more occluded, right? Yeah, that's a good point. But if you look at this multi-crop strategy, Usually mm -hmm. these uh, detailed tricks that you see are because yeah. if your method is not a state of the art, you actually mm -hmm. are going to end up being compared to one of these previous methods and you are not a state of the art. So you need oh. to work a little bit harder to get there. I see. Which is this multi-crop strategy, which may or may not work for text, speech that is yet to be seen or even different architectures. And resonance. Okay. I see. That makes sense. No. Thank you. Yeah, sure.